So um, this is our fifth lecture. We start discussing about brittle deformation. And we will discuss about the deformation mechanisms, brittle deformation mechanisms. And then we'll start discussing about the failure and fracture criteria. Now, these criteria are the mechanical conditions when a volume of rock fails yeah, and fractures. So we want to understand how fractures and then folds form. And to understand this is when do rocks fail? Yeah, under what conditions? So we have some um, mathematical ways of describing these conditions. And these are the failure and fracture criteria. And one of them that we will learn today is called Navier-Coulomb fracture criteria. All right, so that's the idea. Now, uh, I'm starting with something that you have seen. You have seen this diagram, so it is familiar to you. You remember we discussed about structural style from brittle to ductile and about the mechanism, yeah? The mechanism of deformation, which you see on this axis from brittle to plastic. And we have these situations. Uh, and uh, as I said, in the, the, the fourth one, doesn't exist. This is impossible. It, it cannot be a brittle structural style with plastic uh, mechanisms. But we, we have this three possible, yeah? Now, what we'll do, we'll look at, for instance, this one, yeah, brittle with brittle mechanism. The same can be ductile with brittle mechanism, yeah? So brittle behavior, yeah? You see here a definition. So it basically tells you that the, if you have a, a rock, yeah, a rock, and um, at some point under its the stress conditions, uh, the rock loses continuity, yeah, it loses cohesion. So this is basically the brittle behavior. Now, this happens through brittle deformation mechanisms, yeah, um, and you need to have. Uh, the differential stress above a certain critical value for this to occur, yeah, to occur. Um, and the deformation mechanism. Now, here we introduce some. Um, you see fracture growth and frictional sliding, yeah. So uh, fracture growth means you form a fracture, loss of cohesion, yeah. Um, sliding Im implies that there is movement movement along some surface um now we'll see here i'm introducing some new words like cataclasis for instance and we'll see what it means and cataclastic flow yeah so let's look this is a lot of text and you will have time to read it yeah but let's think about these two situations first of all something that is called granular flow so you all went to the beach and you play, and when you are kids, you played with sand, yeah, at the beach, and you saw that the, the sand can flow, yeah? So basically, we are talking about um, something which implies, which implies, um, for instance, grain rotation, yeah? grain rotation so the the grains of sand for example they rotate and they slide one against the other they slide yeah so grain rotation and this frictional sliding leads to what we call granular flow yeah so this is something that this is what happens with this unconsolidated um sediments like sand and we, we talk about granular flow, or you can call it particulate flow, yeah? And the mechanism, the mechanism is frictional sliding grain rotation. So these are the mechanisms. Now, think about this. You have a rock, it is more consolidated, yeah? it doesn't flow easily like this. And under the stress condition, you start forming fractures. So the fractures can be one grain, it is fractured, yeah? So a fracture kind of cuts it. So instead of having one grain, you have two pieces of the initial grain, yeah? So the, that is called 
intragranular fracture, like intra means within one grain. But then you can have fractures that extend across several grains, yeah, across several grains. You have a, a, a solid, a strong uh, rock and a fracture forms and it cuts across several grains. And those are called intergranular fractures, yeah, intergranular fractures. Now, think about this thing. You start creating, so these fractures are, are, are created. And then you can have frictional sliding along these fractures, yeah, once you create them. You can have this. Now, what happens in a fold zone, for instance, it's not only the fracturing, only one fracture. You can get many fractures being formed. So some of the grains initially were bigger, and they get divided into smaller and smaller pieces. Yeah, that's a process called comminution. Yeah, they get uh, they are ground into smaller and smaller pieces. Yeah, so basically you have the fracture, and with the movement, some of the grains get crushed. So they basically are kind of crushed. Many many fractures form, and they they get crushed. Um, so you have the fracture and the crushing of grains and frictional sliding along these new surfaces. And this whole process is called cataclysis. Yeah? It is uh, a term uh, which is assigned to brittle deformation mechanisms. That's cataclysis. Yeah? Um, now, when you have intense cataclysis, yeah, this process is very intense, what happens is there is a, a significant reduction in the size of grains because they get fractured and fractured and so on. They get smaller and smaller fra uh, fragments. And the whole process of movement, yeah, in this zone of fracturing and crushing and so on is called cataclastic flow. Yeah, that's a zone where you have cataclastic flow. So basically, uh, this is the other mechanism. So you can have granular flow, nice like in sand, but in a consolidated rock, yeah, in a consolidated rock, eventually you have cataclastic flow. Yeah, that's what happens. So you already learned something geological, like what happens in the fault zones, yeah? So let's have a, a look at some images here. Um, so if I look at this image, A, it says, um, A, it says deformed porous sandstone. You see, it comes from the United States in the state of Utah. Yeah. So uh, in Utah, you've seen images very nice with these arches and all sorts of land uh, forms that resulted from the erosion of these sandstone, red sandstone layers. Now, uh, in one of these groups, sandstone groups called Mesa Verde, Someone took a sample, put it under the microscope, and looked at the uh, at, at the grains of quartz. Yeah. So if you look at this, for instance, look at this grain. You see these fractures. So these are intragranular fractures. Yeah. You see some in the other grains here, and this one. You see, it's not only one fracture. Look how many fractures are in this grain. Yeah. Now some grains were kind of crushed, and you see smaller uh, smaller fragments on this side. Yeah, for instance, if you look at B, this is no longer a sedimentary rock; is a is a metamorphic rock. So you see, it doesn't have pore space like a, like a sandstone. Yeah, it doesn't have space between the grains; they are interlocked. And here you can see the fractures cutting across different mineral grains yeah it affects this one and this one and uh this one yeah you see you see this thing so these are uh intergranular fractures these are intragranular and intergranular teacher may I ask you a question David. yes uh, for us to easier understanding between these two is there like a strategy for us to look in the microscope to understand the difference, like the continuity of fractures between grains or something like that? Yeah, sure, uh, sure, David. I mean, in this word, each, each word has a meaning. 
like if you if you look for instance if you look at uh let's look here at this at this uh you know a sandstone uh, a, a this sandstone uh image yeah and you look at the fracture like this look at this one yeah basically this one affects only this grain yeah so you see here is another grain but the fracture doesn't extend in this grain so this is a, an intra intra means inside one grain intragranular yeah you have other fractures here like this is intragranular here for sure this small one you this segment yeah intragranular so this would be intragranular within one grain it affects only one whereas an example here in the second in in b is that you see long fractures here that go across several mineral grains for instance look at this one yeah you have one mineral grain here maybe it can be a feldspar so it goes through it then it goes through this maybe this is quartz it goes through this it touches this one i don't know what this one it goes into another grain here so it goes like here so this affects several grains so that that's why they are called intergranular yeah it's like the same like Teacher. the flight yes yes so catac cataclastic uh, yes. uh, flow flow uh is related just for the first one for for oh, no 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 cataclastic flow implies all these processes so what happens is when we talk about sand just like at the beach the sand basically you can take uh, arroz arroz también, uh, you know rice and play with it so we you can make the rice flow from the bag yeah and you can see how it flows basically the grains of arroz rotate or slide one uh, across the other so that is granular flow sugar has granular flow sand uh silt granular flow yeah when we talk about consolidated rock yeah consolidated rock that means a rock that doesn't flow like this because it is consolidated yeah the sandstone uh, the sandstone is formed from sand that got lithified yeah so there is cement that basically uh glues glues all all the, all the um sand grains yeah so when you talk about cohesive yeah uh rock what happens the rock fails so the failure happens in this way you start creating fractures in the rock fractures develop now some fractures will be kind of of affecting only let's say one grain like here yeah our fractures will extend across several grains yeah for instance here for instance even in this example one fracture probably extends in this one yeah uh, or here you see these fractures extending here across two grains for instance so what i mean some fractures uh, occur in one grain and there is a name for it it's intragranular and some fractures cut across several grains and the name is intergranular and what happens as you create fractures 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 and some of them the smaller grains get crushed because they basically from a, uh, an initial grain there are many many pieces yeah and then you start having movement that's how the fault develops movement along this zone of crushing and fracturing and this whole thing this whole um, process that includes all this fracturing and sliding is called cataclastic flow yeah so think about this when you fly yeah you can you can take a flight from bogota to buenos aires but it is in south america so this is an intracontinental flight it's the same like an intragranular fracture or you can take a flight from bogota to amsterdam in europe and then is an intercontinental flight yeah because you go from this continent to europe and and it's the same with these grains yeah intra and inter yeah we use these prefixes 
you see that come from uh, the Latin for different for uh, different situations. So I guess in this way, if you think about the flights, you will remember easily. All right. <laughs> so thank you, David and Gabriel, for your questions. Okay. Here Thanks, is <laughs> yes. Here is another example. Uh, look, this comes from a, a fault zone. A fault zone. Let me take my my um, uh, phone so that I can see what uh, the time is. Uh, this is a fault zone. Yeah, uh, in Arizona. Yeah, in Arizona. So you have this photo mic micrograph, uh, and this is called a microbreccia. So if you look at this, you kind of realize what what happened. This basically, you can imagine, uh, these are fragments. Yeah, they, they are grains, and obviously some of them had fractures along them. Yeah, so they initially they were bigger, but they got fragmented by fractures. Yeah, and some grains got so fractured that basically you have small pieces left from them. Yeah, this is a zone of comminution. So now you can imagine what happens if you have the stress and the, the deformation basically is concentrated in this zone. Now, these two pieces are going to crush even more this zone. So you see, this is a process of comminution, like this big piece survived like this, yeah, was stronger, but other minerals didn't. And those got uh, fractured more and more and more and more, and uh, you, got, you got smaller and smaller fragments. So basically, what you see, you see angular fragments. So angular means you see the angles here, angular fragments of broken. So these are fragments of broken, broken granite and crushed granite. So the crushed part is in here, yeah? So, so the idea is if you, uh, you haven't studied petrology, you studied mineralogy <laughs> with Marcos for sure. But petrology, when you actually look at the, our geological reality and you look at the rocks and you learn about a very important type of rock uh, in the crust, which is called granite. And the granite has, uh, typically has quartz and feldspar and some, maybe some mafic minerals like, uh, like a hornblende or like uh, mica. Yeah, but quartz and feldspar, uh, plagioclase, feldspar, and um, potassic feldspar as well. So imagine that you see, you will see all these uh, mineral grains, yeah, uh, mineral grains interlocked because basically the granite is, is an igneous rock, yeah, so it crystallized from the magma. So there is basically no space between these, these mineral grains. What happens is once a fault zone is created, now these grains basically in the fault zone, this is what happens to them, yeah? So this is what it would look like. And the deformation is concentrated in that zone, yeah? And next to, on each side of this fault zone, the rock will be nice and as it crystallized from the magma, yeah? That's basically, but we look at the microscope here. so. We see what happened, all right? So, so that's why I was saying we have to, to learn these things because then we understand the actual geologic process. All right, uh, so the, this was just to give you some examples. Now, let's, let's uh, we don't have uh, much left. I'll go for a few more slides, uh, but I want your attention a bit. I was saying that we are interested to understand under what conditions uh, volume of rock fractures, yeah, because you have to fracture it and then movement along the fracture will create a fault. So we have to understand the natural law, if you want. And people looked and uh, basically empirically developed some uh, relationships, yeah, some relationships that describe, yeah, under what conditions. Uh, the rocks uh, fracture, they fail. And this is what we call fracture criteria, yeah? So fracture criterion basically shows you the 
the conditions, the stress conditions, uh, when you have fracturing, yeah, the failure of the material. Um, so here is one statement. It says fracture initiation. So to form a fracture, yeah, to have the failure of the rock, you must have differential stress. Like if it's just lithostatic stress, nothing happens. You must have differential stress. That means you must have a maximum stress and the minimum uh, stress, yeah? Uh, and this differential stress must exceed, at some point, it exceeds the set of rock and the rock fails, yeah? So basically what, what matters here, let's say you have constant temperature, you, you want to compare con at constant temperature, constant confining pressure, yeah? Confining pressure means the value of sigma three, yeah? Um, and you want to, to see when different rocks under these conditions fail. So what matters, the parameter that matters is this, the difference between sigma one and sigma three, yeah? And also this, you, you'll, you'll see why in a bit, but it basically, it basically shows you where you are, like the deeper you are actually, the deeper you are, uh, that means uh, this is larger, the deeper you are, uh, the wrong, the rock is uh, stronger, yeah? All right, so uh, a bit more text. So what happens is if you increase the confining pressure, that means, it, for instance, if you bury the rock more and more and more, you have to have a larger differential stress to fracture the rock, yeah? So you remember in the rheological profile, that's why you have the straight line going from zero to the surface like this and the actual uh, brittle uh, failure occurs at a larger and larger differential stress as the, the depth gets larger and larger, yeah? So this is something I already told you. Now let's look, let's look here at this fracture criterion. What happens is Coulomb in the 18th century, the French mathematician, he was very interested in, in this aspect. He experimented with uh, sandstone, for instance, with sand and so on. So, and then there were other people who were interested like Navier and Moore, yeah? And the idea is that, uh, what's called the Coulomb fracture criterion. So the law that tells us when, you know, under what conditions of stress a certain rock fails, this is today called Navier Coulomb or Moore Coulomb or Coulomb Moore. You'll encounter this name for it. So look at this, at this diagram. It's a more diagram, more space, yeah? So I told you this is very important. You have to understand the more representation because we build on it, yeah, uh, our understanding. So just to remind you, here we have the normal stress axis, the shear stress axis. If you know sigma one and sigma three, sigma one for any circle that you draw here, Sigma one is this one, the maximum principal stress. Sigma three is here, the minimal principal stress. So as long as you know them, you can draw this circle. Yeah, they are all normal stress. They are the principal stress axis. Now, on any plane, on any plane within the volume of rock, you can determine the, the normal stress and the shear stress for any plane, yeah? So to know, let's say if you have a plane at 30 degrees relative to sigma three, then you, you calculate here 60 degrees and you draw this radius. This is the point that represents the state of stress on that plane, for instance. So here is a normal stress on that plane, the shear stress on that plane. This is why I gave you this problem on the test because I think it is uh, very important for you to understand these things. So what Coulomb observed yeah, was this, that there is a certain state of stress that he defined empirically, like this point and this point 
and this point on certain planes in a volume of rock when the rock fails. So let's say you have a, a, a test uh, apparatus, yeah, and you take a cylinder of rock, you apply confining pressure to it, yeah, that's sigma three, and you compress it with sigma one. And you want to see, you compress it un until it breaks, until it fails. And then, basically, the point of failure, yeah, you represent for sigma one like this and sigma three like this, you have the point of failure. And here you, you have its coordinates. Then you basically, for a different sigma one and sigma three, so sigma three is very important, you determine another point of failure and so on. You connect these points of failure, and this is a criterion, yeah, which is described here by a straight line, which mathematically is very simple. Yeah, it's a very simple function. You see, a straight line. This is a thing, the straight line. So it relates sigma s, yeah, what you have on this vertical axis, to sigma n, what you have on this axis, yeah. So, and it has these two parameters, yeah. So the two parameters, yeah, uh, phi is called the angle. This is phi, the, the, the slope, the slope of this line. This is called the angle of internal friction. Maybe you heard about it. And uh, tangent of phi is called coefficient of internal friction, yeah? And uh, this parameter C, so you see, this is the equation of a straight line. Yeah, this is the equation of a straight line. This parameter C is called cohesive strength. So you see, when there is when the normal stress is zero, what should be the shear stress to basically break the rock? Yeah, and that's cohesive strength. Cohesive means it loses cohesion. Yeah. So you see this um, now. If you project, if you project this line on this side of the x-axis, sigma n, this point, this point, yeah, it's called the tensile strength of the rock. Now, this is an empirical law. It's an empirical law. That means that we human beings we had to discover how materials behave. And for some of them, this is a law that describes the behavior pretty well. Now, in the tensile part, we'll see next week, in the next, um, in the next lecture, the law is not really obeyed. You, uh, the tensile strength is not really here. It is here, but we'll discuss next time why it's like this. Now we are co concerned about compressing rocks and their failure, yeah? So this is called the Coulomb criterion of failure. What happens is that if you, are, you have a circle like this, it will not touch, it will not be tangent to this Coulomb uh, criterion. That means that the rock will not fail under those sigma one and sigma three. So, um, one more thing, what happens when the cohesive strength, yeah, this one, C, is zero? So it comes here. So the line starts from here. This is the situation for loose sand, yeah? So the loose hand, sand, you play with sand, it has no, basically, cohesion. That's why it's loose. And no tensile strength, yeah? You can pull it apart easily. So for loose sand, this line goes through the origin here, yeah? All right, you will have time to read these things and absorb the, uh, the names, it's but right. yes. But uh, is all of these uh, valid also for heterogeneous material? Well, <laughs> the reality as you uh, suspect, Gabriel, is uh, more complex, definitely. The heterogeneous material, of course, it must have 
no matter what material you take, it must have a failure uh, point, yeah? So let's say if you have, a, when we study rocks, basically, we can take a granite. So the granite is heterogeneous because it has different minerals. And we study what the failure for granite is. Or we can take a monomineralic rock like sandstone, quartz sandstone, and study it for uh, sandstone or for marble. So what I mean to say is that the Coulomb criterion as a straight line, it is actually valid only for certain, for certain rocks as a straight line, yeah? Um, because, and especially some monomineralic rock like sandstone, quartz sandstone. When we have very, we have a large petrological variety. So if you do experiment, experimental mechanics and cr crash rocks, you might not get a Coulomb uh, criterion, yeah? A straight line. This is an envelope, you see, of all these critical states of stress. So these combinations of sigma one, sigma three, sigma one for this circle, sigma three, sigma one, sigma three, they are all tangent to this criterion. So that's critical, yeah? So for certain rocks, this criterion is pretty good. For other rocks, depending as you asked, Gabriel, they can be, the might not be a straight line, might be a curve, and then we call it a more criterion, yeah? So these are experimental criteria in the end. Uh, so this is this type of heterogeneity. Now, there is another situation when you have heterogeneity because you might have a fault, a pre-existing fracture, and that's a different situation. Then the situation changes a bit, and uh, we'll discuss about this in this section of the course. So bear it with me, not today, but we'll address this situation. What happens when you have heterogeneity because of pre-existing fractures? Now we just learn what happens with a rock that is intact, yeah? Virgin, if you want. But your question is very good. Uh, there is a criterion for each rock. It's not always the Coulomb criterion as a straight line, yeah. So thanks for asking it, uh, Gabriel. But I mean, is... because, for example, if I if I analyze uh, some uh, some topographic field, <clears throat> and for example, uh, uh, in in medium scale uh, for a map, uh, <clears throat> um, the outcrops. Uh, uh, not properly just uh, for a microscope, but for for outcrops uh, very large, uh, they are made up of several minerals, uh, different each other among the others. So uh, uh, if I'm going to, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, if some, si una capa va a fallar y cae y uh, causa el deslizamiento o causa un accidente o causa algo por el estilo hay capas que eh, tienen rumbo y buzamiento entonces eh, eh, me interesa saber mucho eso porque me gustaría saber cómo calcular cuándo va a fallar por qué va a fallar y, y, right. y en qué parte del cuerpo fallaría y qué, y qué sector abarcaría en, en in mm. an accident. Well, yeah, well, well, this is not that easy because that's why a rock mechanicists study uh, and we learn from simple to complex uh, because it's uh, typically we look at the history of the formation. So what happened in the past? We don't know really what will happen in the future because um, the rocks, as we see them in uh, in reality, they have many. They are very heterogeneous, and there can be many uh, heterogeneity heterogeneities that influence the uh, failure of the rock. And we might not see those heterogeneities and not be aware of their existence because when we look at an outcrop, it's just 
you know, a part of the whole volume of rock. So um, it's not an easy, uh, not an easy situation. But if you think about, I think you use the Spanish word for um, uh, if you have a movement of uh, like landslides, yeah, landslides, this liaciamento you said, um, the, there are actual conditions and especially they happen in, in these sedimentary layers like uh, with uh, clay, for instance, uh, what can influence their occurrence is the rain because the there is a change in the pore pressure and also using the more diagram it basically i'll show you in a bit what can happen yeah um i'll just in the next slide i'll i'll make a, a reference to this gabriel all right so Thank you. what i want to, <laughs> yeah what i want to say is that the more coulomb criterion basically it defines this straight line defines what's called the failure envelope on the more diagram yeah so what happens is if you have a volume under a state of stress described by sigma one here sigma three here you draw the circle you know from the experimental data that that type of rock fails under this condition these are uh, you know for each rock you have a certain value of the um coefficient of internal friction for instance yeah uh, and of c for each type of rock so the experiments done by rock mechanicists they try to give you the failure criterion for different types of rocks it's a it's an empirical science and basically once you know if this was analyzed in a certain area if the volume of rock and the, the stress conditions in that volume of rock are like this, you are, this white part is called the stable field. So this is a stable field. That volume of rock is not going to fail. But if the stress conditions, let's, let's say this is sigma three is fixed here. Yeah, fixed at this point on this axis. All you have to do is increase sigma one. So if you increase sigma one, the radius of the circle will increase to the point that at some point for a certain value of sigma one, as it increases, this, this uh, more circle will be tangent to this, uh, to this line, which represents a failure criterion for this rock. And then this means that the state of stress is critical. The rock will develop a fracture, it will fail somewhere, yeah? So where will it fail? This is another question, where? And the, the answer from this diagram is a longer plane for which the angle relative to sigma three is half of this angle, yeah? Is theta. Here we have two theta. So basically, you see, this is the tangent. This is a radius perpendicular to the tangent. And this, basically, this point, this corresponds to the plane within the volume of rock where the fracture will develop. Now, this is called unstable state of stress. Yeah, If the Moore cir circle it basically crosses Uh, I don't know what you mean by complementary, but I, I, the idea is that this is the angle, yeah, this is two theta, yeah, in the more space. In the physical space, half of this angle represents the angle of the plane relative to sigma three. Anyway, what I mean to say, this is not possible, yeah, unstable, because once it gets to critical, it fails. The, the, the rock fails. So this is an impossible condition to achieve because it, it, it would be like, to be like this means that the rock didn't fail. Like what happens? This, we are talking about natural law, yeah? 
this is a criterion which is empirical, that we basically know about it by doing experiments, by seeing when that rock fails. Yeah, it's not our invention. For certain materials, this criterion is a straight line, and then we call it Navier Coulomb or Moore Coulomb fracture criterion. Okay, so what happens? What happens? As I was discussing uh, with Gabriel, the idea is that if you have an increase in pore pressure in this rock, for instance, you have an increase in pore pressure, what it will do, the effective stress will decrease. So it will be like you would have the pore pressure, the actual stress that the rock grains fail, uh, feel, yeah, feel, they feel, it's sigma one minus the pore pressure, sigma three minus the pore pressure, because the pore pressure basically tries to push on the grains and the grains push one against the other. So the pressure, pore pressure is opposite to the actual compressive stress. So what you, it will do, it will move basically the existence of pore pressure will translate this circle to the left. So there is a moment when this circle will touch, yeah, will touch the limit of the stability field and then the rock fails. And this is what Gabriel was asking about the landslides, for instance. You have a lot of rain and the pore pressure in the rock increases. And then by increasing it, the actual effective stress decreases. So if you were to look in the more diagram, the rock at some point as this goes to the left, the whole circle will touch yeah, the limit of the stability field and you'll have failure. Yeah, that's the idea. All right, now uh, this, I'm, I'm gonna finish with this. This is very interesting and uh, important. This is something you have seen. This basically describe the value of the normal stress and the shear stress. But when we discussed what happens on a plane, we have the normal stress and the shear stress. So the idea is, it, depending on the angle of the plane, the angle, you remember, you had to study this for the test, depending on the angle, the value of the normal stress and the shear stress, they change. And the normal stress, when you have zero, which means perpendicular to sigma one, yeah, perpendicular to sigma one, you have normal stress, the maximum, and no shear stress. And you start, and then at some point at 45 degrees, you have the maximum shear stress. Now, what's interesting here, what is interesting here is that the failure doesn't happen at 45 degrees, although here you have the maximum shear stress. The reason is because, because sigma n, the normal stress, is strong enough to prevent shearing. But then there is an angle and this angle tends to be at 60 degrees, at 60 degrees, when sigma n decreased with a faster rate than sigma s. So at some point, the balance between the two stresses, the normal and the shear, is such that the shear stress takes over and the rock fails along planes more or less at 60 degrees. Now, you can see this here. Look at this. So this is the tangent to the circle. And if we had the plane at 45 degrees, the maximum shear stress as, the, as in the test, that's why I asked you, because again, it's a, a thing that I want you to be aware of. The maximum shear stress is here, represented here, yeah? At 45 degrees, yeah? 90 degrees here in the Mohr circle, 45 in reality. Now, here you have 120 degrees, which means 60 degrees in reality. And this is where you have the plane of failure. So you see nature is very interesting and it gives us surprising results. So the failure normally does, doesn't happen where, where you have the maximum shear stress at 45 degrees, 
it happens at 60 degrees, yeah? So that's what this text explains here and in the textbook the same. Now, this is for today. You see only 11 slides uh, with the first slide and the last slide. So basically, I think it's kind of enough for today for you to, to think about these things. If you have questions, David, Gabriel, or uh, anyone else, please ask me. <laughs> if you don't, feliz tarde, feliz fin de semana, y nos vemos uh, martes. Hasta martes, yo voy a poner en uh, SICUA, yo creo que en este fin de semana, los resultados de uh, sus respuestas um, para el examen parcial, ¿sí? Uh, sí, entonces, uh, yo voy a detener uh, uh, esta presentación y nos vemos martes. Gracias a todos. Thank you, teacher. You are very welcome. All of you are.